733 in the uh, Mission Praise 733. We praise you, we bless you, our Saviour Divine. I'm really hoping that you know the tune to this, or if you don't, that you learn it very quick because we haven't got the music to this one, so we're going to have to sing it uh, a cappella, as they say. So 733, let's stand to sing. <laughs> We praise you, we bless you, our Saviour divine. O power and dominion are yours for all time. We sing of your mercy with joyful acclaim. For you have redeemed us all praise to your name. All honour and praise to your excellent name. Your love is unchanging, forever the same. We bless and adore you, O Saviour and King. With joy and thanksgiving, your praises we sing. The strength of the hills and the depths of the sea, the earth and its fullness, yours always shall be. And yet to the lowly, you listen with care to ready their humble petitions to hear. Your infinite goodness our tongues shall employ. You give to us richly all things to enjoy. We'll follow your footsteps, we'll rest in your love, and soon we shall praise you in mansions above. Amen. That's a, a good effort, well done. Right, I'm going to turn to uh, the Word of God. I'm going to read from the third chapter of Proverbs uh, this evening. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, it's all part still of the wisdom uh, teaching that the, uh, the, the narrator, orator, uh, is giving. Proverbs chapter 3. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favour and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honour the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding, for her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honour. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. 
Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your feet from being caught. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbour, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not devise evil against your neighbour, for he dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with a man without cause, if he has done you no harm. Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. So read God's word. And you can see real echoes there, can't you, of New Testament teaching, uh, Sermon on the Mount, which we're looking at, as well as the more obvious phrase that we find in James. Well, let's pick up our hymn books and uh, sing number 773. 773. Uh, with harps. And with vials there stands a great throng in the presence of Jesus and sing this new song. Unto him who has loved us and washed us from sin, unto him be the glory forever. Amen. That's a great thought, isn't it? That there are people standing and singing to the honour of the Lord Jesus. Let's stand to sing. 773. Ups and with fire, there stands a great throne in the presence of Jesus and sing this new song unto him who has loved us and washed us from sin, unto him be the glory forever. Defiled in his sight, now arrayed in pure garments, in praise they unite unto him who has loved us and washed us from sin, unto him be the glory forever. Amen. has brought us and taught us this new song to sing unto him who has loved us and washed us from sin unto him be the glory forever amen a helpless and hopeless we sit if he never had loved us to cleanse from our sin, unto him who has loved us and washed us from sin, unto him be the glory forever. Amen. Aloud in his praises, our voices shall ring, so that others believing this new song shall sing, unto him who has loved us and washed us from sin, unto him be the glory forever. Amen. those things that we have read and sung on our minds let's come to God in prayer let's all pray
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your house this evening to uh, pray and praise and worship you. We read in your word that you are given many names and, and one of your names is that of Adonai, that you are the Lord of all. You are the master of all you survey, as the uh, play says, and you are the one who has made all things. And to you belongs the worship of all. Uh, we have a glimpse in heaven of those who sing your praises, of those wonderful creatures who bow down before you and worship you. And we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and they will do so to the honour of the Father. And so Lord we gladly bow the knee before you this evening we gladly come and worship you uh, and to praise you this evening to say thank you for all that you have done for us. We wonder that there is a God like you. We cannot really fathom all that there is to know about a God like you. One who is so powerful, so wise, that you could make the worlds from nothing. You are the one who founded the earth with your wisdom. You are the one who changed it all when the flood came. And uh, it became, in many ways, physically a different world. But you still... Uh, you still uh, order that world and sustain that world and you gave promises that there would never be another flood until the end of time and so we live in the light of that promise and we thank you Lord that one day there is coming a day when you will come back and you will take your people to be with yourself and so shall we ever be with the Lord and we ask that you would help us to have a right balance of looking forward to the day when you will call us or come for us and to, to address the work that you have given us to do on earth. We are uh, here as your ambassadors. We are here as your disciples, as your servants. And we have a message to give to the world. And uh, for some it's perhaps more of a message by word. For all of us it's a message by the way that we live our lives and the way that we say things, and the things that we don't say. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us this week uh, to be those who adore you and worship you and confess you in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you love to hear us. We thank you that you're not an unwilling God in any sense, but you are present with us. And we thank you for the, present, for the promise of your presence uh, with us. But Lord, we bring others to you this evening and we pray for them. Uh, we once again just pray for Jan, who at the moment is in hospital waiting for some more tests. Uh, we pray for her that you would give the doctors much wisdom. We pray that you would give them the answers to her situation. Uh, we, we pray about this possibility of an MRI uh, scan that uh, has been... Uh, um, she'd been waiting for for so long maybe Lord that would be even possible to get that done sooner uh, rather than later so that there may be some answers for the doctors but we just lift her and Paul yes. up to you uh, right now and pray that you would be with them mm -hmm. that you would that they would know your presence whilst they're in this uh, this uh, difficult place mm -hmm. pray for Jacqueline and we pray for all the children uh, that you would comfort them also and be with them and give them a sense of your peace. We pray for uh, Scott and we pray for all of those in the family who do not yet know you as Saviour and Lord, that you would have mercy upon each one. We once again thank you for the joy of seeing little Thomas this morning and pray that you would bless him and uh, continually, Lord, may you build his strength up that uh, as he faces this operation in the coming weeks or months, uh, that he will be strong enough uh, and that you might take him through that uh, operation as well as all of the other things that you've brought him through. We thank you, Lord, uh, for answers uh, to prayer. We again lift uh, John up to you, Lord, and we pray that you would be with him where he is. You would comfort him. Uh, he must still be in, in so much uh, shock and, and sorrow. And so we lift him to you, Lord, and pray that you would bless him and that you would do his soul good, that you would be with him and comfort him. Uh, at this moment in time. Help him, Lord, as he has to make arrangements and, and do physical things which are most difficult to do at a time like this. We just pray for him, uh, that you would be with him and that he would know your strength and that he would know your comfort. And we pray, Lord, for others in the fellowship, others who need you and a touch from you. We think of 
young Theo and pray again that you would help him in his pain. Lord, to have this kind of pain day after day after day is so debilitating. We pray that you would bless him. We pray that you would touch his body, that you would heal him, that you would uh, give him respite from pain. Once again, that you would give doctors uh, wisdom and, uh, and discernment as to how they can help him and treat him uh, the best. So we just lift him up to you and pray that you would bless him also where he is right now. Be with the family, we pray, and help them uh, all together to uh, pull together at a time like this. We know that in a time like this, things can be difficult, and we just pray that you would guard them and protect them by the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would be one in Christ, and that they would help one another at this very, very difficult time. So we just lift the family to you. And Lord, for others uh, whom you know, uh, because you know all about all of us, we just lift one another to you and pray that you would bless and help and strength and comfort where it is needed. We ask, Lord, for us who, uh, as it were, on the outside seem to have no problems, but uh, we still need you. And we ask that you would walk with us and help us this week to honour you and to serve you in the way that you've asked us to, whatever that might be and wherever that might be. Uh, we just pray that you'd help us to be faithful in the so-called little things of life. So, Lord, we give ourselves to you and we ask that you would be with us Thank you, Lord, for all your goodness. Thank you for all your kindness. Thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who died for us, that we might live eternally with you. So be with us in our worship, we pray. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, can I invite you to turn to uh, the second book of the Kings and uh, chapter 4. <coughs> So 2 Kings 4, chapter, uh, verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil then he said go borrow vessels from everywhere from all your neighbors empty vessels do not gather just a few and when you have come in you shall shut the door behind you and your sons then pour it into all the vessels and set aside the full ones so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your sons live on the rest. Well, we pray God would add his blessing to the reading of his word. And as we come to uh, look at that in a few moments. Uh, before we do though, let's uh, sing number 699 in the mission praise, 699, thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, hear us we humbly pray, and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light, number 699. and darkness heard and took their flight hear us we humbly pray and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray let there be light thou who didst come to bring 
thy redeeming wing, healing and sight, help the sick in my sight to live in my oh now to all mankind let there be light. Spirit of truth and love, thy healing holy dove, speak forth thy flight, move on the waters face, bearing the lamp of grace, and in a darkest place let there be light. Blessed and holy three, glorious Trinity, wisdom, love, might, boundless as ocean's tide, rolling in fullest fright through the earth far and wide let there be last hymn I chose and wasn't in the book, but it is. I've just got the number wrong. Well, let's uh, turn to uh, this uh, interesting uh, little story. And um, if you went with us last time we looked at Elisha, uh, we uh, just come from a situation where Elisha is on the national stage, as it were. He's uh, uh, standing before three kings. Uh, one is a godly king. Uh, and loves the Lord and follows him, one who uh, knew the truth and rejected it outright, and a third who kind of uh, hovered between the two. And uh, that story is an illustration that the Lord uh, looks on the heart. And so early in Elisha's ministry, there is this uh, kind of announcement of him uh, and uh, his position as the man of God uh, to Israel and to the wider world, really. Uh, this man who was announced to uh, the, the king of Israel as the man who pours water on the hand uh, or poured water on the hand of Elijah uh, is now the man of God to Israel and uh, kind of steps as it were out of the shadow uh, into the national stage and so the king of Israel has had a lot to do with Elijah and his predecessor but uh, this is now the first time Elisha has uh, come to the fore. And so that's a great comfort uh, to Israel. It's a comfort to the godly remnant that are in Israel because they now know that uh, with Elijah's ministry, uh, the word of God has not finished. It's not finished. It's not over. Uh, it hasn't ceased to be. There is still a witness of God. There is still a man of God. Uh, and uh, they can go to him and they can go to him for help. And this man of God acts, as it were, as the eyes and the voice and the ears uh, of uh, the Lord. And it brings to a degree, a godly restraint uh, amongst the people of Israel. We'll find out in subsequent chapters that Elisha continues what is known as the school of the prophets, uh, this group of young men who, um, as it were, leave society and dwell together and study God's word together. And uh, that's quite an encouragement. We think of the spiritual declension that was going on in Israel at that time, that uh, here is this uh, group of people. But what's going to happen to Elisha, people might be asking. Is he now going to become the king's counsellor? Uh, after all, he's you know saved the bacon, as it were, of the uh, king of Israel. Uh, what's going to happen now? Is he going to stride the national stage like Elijah did, uh, proclaiming and rebuking and so on? But as we read this story, we are reminded that this is not Elisha's first calling. Uh, he, he goes back to where he was before. Uh, he doesn't stay uh, in Samaria, he doesn't stay in Jerusalem, he goes home and he goes back to the uh, place where God has called him to serve. He, he's a kind of a local man, really, he's not interested in fame and fortune as it were. Elisha 
it's quite clear from this story, is available to everyone. Anyone can call to him for help. And uh, I think I may have said this before, but if I haven't, well, we'll say it now. Elisha's ministry, a ministry like no other ministry uh, in, of any prophet in the Old Testament, really parallels the ministry of the Lord Jesus himself. When you look at Elisha, the things that he does, uh, you'll see um, in so many ways uh, a likeness to that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that's quite deliberate, isn't it? Uh, as Elijah, uh, you know, is followed by Elisha, so the Lord Jesus follows John the Baptist. And so there's this double parallel here. Elijah is uh, the, the kind of the prophetic John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the fulfillment, really, of Elisha, Elijah and his promise. And Elisha is a kind of introduction to the ministry of the Lord Jesus uh, Christ and we're so 800 years or so when the Lord walked the earth uh, and the people s saw the miracles that he did and heard the words that he said and watched the people that he helped then I'm sure that they would have looked at the uh, the books uh, and read about Elisha and thought how much uh, they were alike and so as we have a look at about this story you can see that the things that happen in this story are so very different to what's happened uh, in the previous chapter. Uh, but more than that, uh, this is a story where we begin to see, uh, if you like, God helping the, the, the individual. Up till now, uh, the, the, the stories of uh, the writings uh, of, of Israel, so um, the, the, the writings of Judges, uh, sorry, Joshua Judges, Samuel and the Kings, um, the, the Israelites would have, would have had those as, as former prophets they, they are not so much a history of Israel as they are the unfolding of God's purposes uh, in Israel and, and for his own glory. And so the ancient Jewish um, people would have had this book as the last uh, of uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, former prophets. And uh, the former prophets are all about how God has dealt with Israel. Well, up to now, he's really been dealing with kings and judges national affairs international affairs and, and this is what the story has been about uh, you know we read about you know Saul becoming king and uh, David becoming king and Solomon and all his riches then the division of the kingdom it's all been about a national picture isn't it but here in the ministry of Elisha we start seeing just like the Lord Jesus Christ the uh, the, the kind of ministry to individuals uh, to to little people like you and me uh, you know, Elisha doesn't really spend most of his time dealing with kings and the national picture. He spends most of his time dealing with ordinary people. And uh, we read of the Lord Jesus that that's what he did. The common people heard him gladly. And so the ministry of the Lord Jesus, uh, of Elisha rather, prefigures that of the Lord in uh, a way that no other's done. Uh, the Lord, as we know, uh, helps widows. He kills lepers. Uh, he heals deaf and dumb people and so on. And Elisha gets involved in that sort of ministry. And so uh, this man is a different sort of prophet. Uh, this man is a prophet of grace. This man is a prophet who shows and demonstrates the grace of God. And I, sh and I suggest to you that only the Lord Jesus himself surpasses him uh, in this regard. And so uh, we can think of examples, you know, think of Bartimaeus, um, who uh, is sitting by the side of the road. You can just picture the scene, can't you? You know, he's, he's shouting out, uh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And there are many in the crowd who probably thought, well, yeah, you know, <coughs> Jesus could help him. But what's the answer? Be quiet. You know, he's not interested in somebody like you. But of course, the Lord Jesus was interested in somebody like him. Think of the blind man in John chapter 9. Uh, who's, who's healed of his blindness and he, he can see. And uh, what's the answer? What's the, the attitude of the people of the temple? Well, they throw him out. You know, the moment he says, well, you know, <laughs> you're saying this man's a sinner, but since the creation of the world, there's never been seen that a man who's a sinner has healed the eyes of the blind. And they go, well, who do you think you are teaching us? And they throw him out. And so uh, this is uh, the kind of ministry that the Lord Jesus I got involved in. So we have here uh, Elisha, the ministry, uh, the, pro the prophet rather, uh, of grace. So the story itself then, the first thing to notice is that uh, we have this indebted prophet. 
All right, this man who is a prophet, uh, or this phrase, the sons of the prophets, which is this group of men that we were talking about, and we'll find out later on about in the, in the book, uh, he has died. He has died relatively young, uh, but his boys are still at home, they're not married, um, and he's died in debt. Now, I wonder if that surprises you, uh, that uh, a man of God, a man who kind of gave his life to studying God's word and to serving the Lord, uh, he dies in debt. We're not told that he um, died through you know, profligacy. We don't, tell, we don't read that he was wasting his money or that um, you know, he, he was, was unwise with it in any way. He's uh, certainly not rebuked for that. But no doubt times were difficult. Here is uh, the, the finishing of the period of Ahab uh, and Jezebel. We know that they, they persecuted the prophets. We know that some had to hide in caves. Uh, so maybe there was persecution by Jezebel that uh, maybe that's the reason that he was poor. Maybe he was one of the 7,000, we assume he was, that never bowed the knee to Baal. And we know that they had to hide uh, some of them in, in caves. In fact, there's an interesting tradition amongst Jewish scholars uh, that uh, this man may well even be an Obadiah, the steward of Ahab, the man who hid these prophets and fed them with bread and water. We have no way of knowing but I like to read these things. They're, they're interesting possibilities, aren't they? But what we do know is that this man was known to Elisha. Uh, he was a man who feared the Lord. Um, maybe he was poor because he wasn't wise, as the, the wisdom of the world uh, is, is wise uh, and all of that. Perhaps he just wasn't that interested in money. But he was about the business of preaching and teaching God's word to a very needy uh, nation. Um, perhaps he lived by faith, uh, as we say, and uh, it seems now that faith is misplaced, doesn't it? I mean, the man has died, and uh, he's left a widow and these young sons. And I say they're young because they're clearly not married and left home. But no doubt, uh, we can say he died in faith that the one he loved and served would honour that love and that service after he's gone. So we're not told why he was poor. We do know that uh, this widow uh, was not only bereaved and going through the sadness of that, but uh, she had these harsh and unfeeling creditors knocking on the door. And God's people are not exempt uh, from trouble and difficulty in the world. And the world will have what it uh, demands, won't it? Uh, the world doesn't know anything of mercy, but uh, God knows. Uh, and into that situation steps Elisha. And secondly, we notice that the debt had to be paid. Notice what Elisha doesn't do. He doesn't go and negotiate with the creditors. Neither does he have a, a word to them and send some packing. Uh, he acknowledges the debt is real. We are to pay our dues, aren't we? We are to owe no man anything. Uh, and, and even in the Proverbs uh, chapter that we read this evening, you know, there is this teaching that you know if you have the means to pay what you owe, then we should pay. And so we said already, the world doesn't know how to show uh, mercy. Uh, and uh, no matter what the situation of the widow is, uh, they uh, want their money. And even if the world or somebody in the world does you a favour, uh, there is still that sense that you owe them. You've heard the phrase, you owe me. You know, I've done you a favour, I'm going to cash it in at a later date. And so it is very rare uh, for a person of the world to uh, ever let anybody off anything else. And it certainly isn't the case here. And then thirdly, notice that the debt put the widow in a hopeless, seeming hopeless situation. What was that situation? Well, the law allowed for sons to be used as slaves for seven years to pay off the debt. So here is this woman, she's just lost her husband, and she faces looting her sons for seven years. And the question is, well, who is going to provide for her? How was she going to live? Um, how, are they, how are her sons going to cope with being someone else's slave uh, for seven years? How far away would they be? Would they see her? And all of those kind of things were no doubt rushing through her minds. And we don't have the answers to any of those things, but it seems that this was uh, something that was going to happen. And so the debt was real and it had to be paid for. And then I want you to notice Elisha, what does he do? Well, he asks, asks her two questions. First thing he says is, uh, in verse 2, what shall I do for you? What shall I do for you? I want you to notice that. Uh, again, here is the man 
of grace. Here is the man who's just strode the national stage and he might have come back feeling rather self-important. And, you know, and here am I, you know, I'm influencing you know, national and international politics. Uh, and I'm someone great. There's nothing of that, is there, at all. He says to this widow woman, somebody whose society would not rank or rate, what shall I do for you? How can I help you? And that's an example, isn't it? And maybe a challenge to us. Are we people who are ready to help? Are we people who are almost looking for the opportunity to help? Are we approachable? Are we uh, keen to help people uh, when we can? Uh, we may not have Elisha's ministry, but we have our own ministry. How do we use what God has given to us? And then his second question uh, in the same verse is, what do you have in the house? What do you have? What can you do? Uh, it's, uh, uh, to, to kind of pay this debt off what, what do you have uh, to contribute and the answer is not a lot but just a jar of oil I, I do have a jar of oil and the kind of way that she says that this this jar of oil we don't know what sort of oil it was assumingly it was cooking oil it might have been oil to burn lamps we're not really sure um, but but it looks like it's totally insignificant doesn't it and it reminds us doesn't it of the miracle in John 6 where uh, there are these this crowd of people and they followed the Lord Jesus all day and uh, Jesus says to the disciples he says, well you know um, the end the day is far spent you know and they say well yeah send the people home <laughs> we can't can't be responsible for these and he goes no 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 you give them something to eat so they they sit down and and and, uh, and, he, and he says well what do you have and I think it's Andrew who says well we've got a boy here with five loaves and two fish but what are they amongst so many and yet it's what they had and Jesus took what they had and in exactly the same way uh, this woman has this jar of oil and what sort of oil it was we don't know but she gives it to Elisha she gives it to God uh, hoping and trusting that God will do something with it and so then we've had Elijah, Elisha's two questions and we have Elisha's two answers and so he says uh, uh, go and uh, borrow vessels from everywhere from all your neighbors empty vessels do not gather just a few all right here's a, a faith stretcher for you uh lady all right how are you going to go uh, and and how many jars are you going to go and borrow but he says go and borrow every jar you can every vessel you know whatever you can find that's empty bring it home and uh, again there are echoes of john chapter 2 aren't there where you remember the lord jesus is invited to a wedding they run out of wine and the servants could kind of look in amongst each other and go, oh, I've got no wine, what are we going to do? And so Mary uh, finds out about it. And she says, in great faith, bear in mind, Mary hasn't seen Jesus do any miracles at this point. She says to him, whatever he says to you to do, do it. All right. And so the servants actually have the bottle, if you pardon the pun, to actually go and fill these jars up with, uh, with water. And they know it's water. And they take it to the master of the feast and they pour out what then becomes wine. So amazing faith and amazing obedience. And so again, it is with this widow woman. She does exactly what Elisha tells her to do. She borrows all the pots, or it looks like she sends her sons out actually. And clearly they're young and they've got the legs. Right, off you go. Go and knock on the neighbor's doors and get every single empty vessel that you can. And so, uh, according to your faith be it unto you uh, which is a statement we find in the gospels uh, well here it is for her and so she goes out and she gets all of these empty vessels uh, pots and bottles and goodness knows what and she brings them back and of course we know the story uh, she you know the jar that she's got it keeps pouring it just keeps carrying on pouring until she's got you know we can kind of imagine the room full can't we of, uh, of full up jars of oil and so Elisha then says, right, go and sell and keep uh, and live. And so she says, you know, go and pay off your debts. Okay, so the debt is paid in full. And although we don't know the answer to how many pots there were, quite clearly she has a great faith because she has enough to pay off the debt, whatever that debt was. Uh, presumably it was quite a large debt if it was going to take uh, her sons as slaves for seven years to pay it off. Uh, but not also she had enough to live on. So as it were, she could retire and she had her pension pot uh, all full up. Maybe she had enough to set up a business of some sort, who knows. But whatever, 
There was enough. God provided enough. And so as we uh, have this little story, we might think, okay, well, why is it here? Why, why is this in the Bible? And what, what can we learn from it? Well, again, let's, let's have a look at some of the key phrases there. Look at verse 2, when Elisha says, what shall I do for you? Uh, if we turn to uh, Luke 18, 41, we have exactly the same uh, question asked. Uh, this is uh, the blind man that we were referring to earlier on. So Jesus, uh, so he says, you know, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, Jesus asked him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? And you might think, well, it, it's a very obvious question, isn't it? I mean, I'm blind. I mean, what do you think I want you to do for me? But Jesus makes him answer, doesn't he? The point is, is what, the, the, what Jesus wanted him to do is to identify what his real need was and bring that need to him. And so it's a reminder that when we're praying for the Lord Jesus, particularly when it comes to the aspects of uh, prayer, where we're asking him for things, because prayer is more than asking him for things, as we've started to look at on a Sunday morning. But when we're asking him for things, I want you to kind of imagine, if you like, if it's not too irreverent, to say, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? What can I do for you? And if the Lord Jesus was visible, standing in front of you this evening, and, and, uh, and, and he said to you, what would you want to me to do for you? What would we ask him? What would be the one thing that we would ask him uh, to do? Uh, hopefully, if we're, if we're not Christians, our first prayer would be, well, save me, Lord. Amen. But if we are saved, well, what is the thing that you would like the Lord Jesus to do for you? Perhaps to deal with what we call a, a besetting sin. Perhaps it's to do with a sadness or a difficulty or poverty or 101 things. But the Lord says to us when we pray, what do you want me to do? For you what would you like me what would you like to ask me to do for you and secondly i know i want you to notice and again as i've said to you many times there's a lot of parallels here with the teaching of the sermon on the mount you notice that the widow was commanded to shut the door that's interesting isn't it she wasn't commanded to go outside in the yard which might have been a bit more practical if you're kind of you know spilling drops of oil and that sort of thing well, elisha says go in and shut the door Shut the door behind you and your sons. Nobody else needs to know what's going on. And that reminds us, doesn't it, that God's work is often done in secret, isn't it? And the reason that that's the case is so that we might have our faith strengthened. It means that the kind neighbours who lent their pots never actually saw what God did with their small act of kindness. That's interesting, isn't it? And you might say to yourself sometimes, well, what do I do for the Lord? What, what, what is my gift? <coughs> But this, these neighbours just lent an empty pot. Maybe one neighbour had 20 pots, maybe one neighbour just had one pot. But they all lent the pots, but they never actually <coughs> saw there and then what God did with it. And so often it's those little things that we do, those little things that we think are so insignificant, maybe we've forgotten about them the next day. They're the things that the Lord takes notice of. But it also reminds us that the good works that we do, they are to be done in secret. And sometimes you and I are called to give a cup of water uh, in the name of the Lord. But it's to be done in secret. It's to be done without looking for that reward. It's just a little act of kindness that we just do. And we sometimes have no idea how God blesses that. And then thirdly, I'd like us to consider the symbolism of the oil. Does that have anything to teach us? Well, scholars, as always, have lots of different opinions, and uh, they uh, they all think, well, it, it stands for certain things. Some say, well, it stands for prayer, obviously, you know, it's the kind of pouring out of offering and that sort of thing. Others say, well, the oil is the Holy Spirit. Just read Zechariah. But, again, I suggest to you, this oil, if it stands for anything, stands for the grace of God. And so we have a picture in this story of the grace of God in the Gospel. We are in a greater debt to God than the widow ever was to her uh, debtors. Debt in the Bible is always a picture of sin. 
We're told that whoever sins is the servant of sin or the slave of sin. And this slavery has no worldly deliverer. And the Bible says quite soberly that we are all sinners. We've all sinned. If you and I break the law of this land, uh, if we offended the law, we will be dealt with according to the laws of this land. And even if we feel it's a bit unfair. I don't know whether you've um, you know, ever kind of been given a, a speeding fine because you didn't notice that there was a sign there. Perhaps the sign was covered up or it you know, wasn't very clearly visible and you feel it's unfair. But it's the law. And so technically, physically, really, you've broken the law. You may not have meant to, but you've broken the law. And the law says there's a consequence. There's a punishment. Well, it's exactly the same and more so with God. The reason that we have the Ten Commandments, and they are universal for all people for all time, the reason we have those Ten Commandments is because it tells us what God's standard is. This is how the human beings that I have created should live their lives. This is how you obey me. This is how you follow me. And if you break that law, soul that sins, it shall die, says Ezekiel 18 verse 20. So who's going to rescue us? from this situation who's going to take us out of this slavery not the law not the world only grace yeah. only the grace of god in the gospel only jesus who is given to us uh, out of, uh, because of the grace of god he has given us the just to the unjust uh, to bring us to god jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who come to god by him you may feel tonight well you know, I can't be saved. I, I've sinned too badly. Um, maybe I, I, I've even sinned after hearing the Bible. And so therefore I've got even less excuse than I had beforehand. But Jesus says, I am able to save to the uttermost. To those who come to God through him. He has the power, the unlimited capacity uh, to do so. And so he says to you, he says to me, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden with your burden of sin, uh, and I will give you rest. Um, I know that I quote John Bunyan probably too many times, but that picture in Pilgrim's Progress, where this man has got a burden on his back, it's so heavy he can hardly walk with it. He can't get it off, he can't shrug it off, he can't cut it off. It's a picture of his sin, and it's only when he goes to the cross that the burden is loosed by an unseen hand. It falls off, it goes down the hill, he never sees it again. So this oil that was sold pays the widow's debts. The oil was a gift of God. Salvation is also a gift, the unique gift of God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who works in us to bring us salvation. And as I said already, the Holy Spirit is often likened uh, to oil. The Holy Spirit is poured out like oil on mankind. Today and every day, uh, there are still those who are being saved. That little phrase in, Luke, in, in Acts, Gospel, Acts, Acts of the Apostles rather, that Luke writes uh, that the Lord was adding daily such as should be saved. Well, he's still doing that, isn't he? You know, it's just a bigger world nowadays. He's not just saving people in Jerusalem. He's saving people all over the world. And even though in this country that might be harder to, uh, to grasp, yet we know from the reports that we have of missionaries in other nations that God is saving people in great numbers, greater numbers perhaps, than ever before but there is one other uh, application of the oil and that is uh, the, uh, the as i mentioned zechariah earlier on the oil is a bit like the oil in the candlestick that zechariah mentions this is the oil of the witness of the church and uh, if you turn to uh, zechariah chapter 4 and it's the last but one book of the old testament uh, so uh, if you go backwards from matthew malachi zechariah uh, and uh, chapter 4, we read these rather uh, interesting words in Zechariah chapter 4. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it. <gasps> one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? And the angel who talked with me, answered and said, Do you not know what these are? 
And I said, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you should become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro. Then I answered him and said, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? And he says, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now, it's not time to preach another sermon on a different passage, but we're talking here about the oil. Uh, The oil never ran out because the two olive trees that were there constantly supplied it with oil. The olive trees, number one, Joshua the high priest, and Zerubbabel uh, the ruler, signify both God's power and God's efficacy, or God's ability to save. These are what sustained the church in the midst of a crooked and hostile world. And here's where we are in the New Testament era. The world may hate the church, and uh, you know we're not so much outright hostility in this country, Uh, Growing hostility maybe, growing impatience with our refusal to allow the world to say what is good is, is, uh, is, uh, what is bad is good rather. But across the world we know that there are many people who are suffering terrible persecution uh, because the world hates the church. And although the world would do everything in its power to extinguish the church, extinguish the flame if you like, it cannot. Because God continually supplies it with oil to keep the light burning. I'm sure that you've sung that children's song if you've been a Christian for any length of time or been around church. You know, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. I mean, it sounds a bit corny now, doesn't it? But this is where it comes from. That the light of the church is fueled by the oil of the Spirit. And so we have this ability, we have this power, we have this commission, we have this authority, we have this provision of God to continually be the light of of the world, uh, to be a light set on a hill, as the Lord Jesus says, giving light to all. That's our work. And because Jesus is king, uh, he has the power to keep us and save us. So the oil symbolizes uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, the oil symbolizes the work of grace, but also the oil symbolizes the unity of God's people. Uh, You'll know uh, Psalm 133, I'm quite sure. Uh, But in there we have this rather strange picture where David says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And you might say, yeah, okay, we'll agree with you there, David. Um, It is a good thing. Much better to be united than to be divided and bickering amongst ourselves. And David said, well, okay, I'm going to give you a picture to kind of emphasise that, to kind of reinforce the message. Uh, And he says, it's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to say to me, well, um, could you give me perhaps your best picture of unity? I don't think many of us would go, yeah, it's a bit like pouring oil on someone's head and it drips down his beard onto his coat and onto the floor. It's not kind of what we would say is a good picture, is it? But this is what the Lord says. And so he says, uh, this is the man who is standing in the place of, of uh, blessing for us. Here's the man who is standing between Israel and God. He's their high priest. And we have a high priest, don't we? Who stands between us and God. Elijah referred to standing in the gap last week. And the Lord Jesus has done that for us, hasn't he? And so we keep the unity of the brotherhood by being linked, being close, walking with, being in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more we do that, the easier it will be for us to keep uh, the, pro- the, the command that Paul gives, where he says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. 
And so unity is symbolised by this oil. And so, uh, and, and fourthly, as we come to a close, the oil was given as long as there was a vessel to fill it. Now, therefore, the grace of God is only limited by the capacity that we have to receive it. I wonder if you've ever thought about it like that. Uh, sometimes when people and perhaps preachers talk of grace, we kind of, uh, I'm not quite sure how we picture that, but picture grace as this oil that God continually pours out. And all we need to do, as it were, is to receive that. What does that mean, though? What does that look like in real life? Well, what it looks like is we need to continually come to God and ask him for his grace. Mm. Ask him for grace to help in time of need. We need God to give us his grace, his special help, uh, to uh, do all the things that he's asked us to do. To use the picture of the story, we need to bring our vessels to God for him to fill. Well, what vessels are we talking about? Uh, what does that look like in, in the real world on Monday morning when you're getting up and doing what you've got to do? Well, of course, the first vessel that we have is the need of conversion. Now, we've said this already, but we do need to, to emphasise it again. And, you know, I don't know you, uh, your heart, I don't know where you stand before God, but I need to ask you again and to challenge you again. Have you cried out to God for mercy? You must come to him for mercy. Whether you're, you think you're good enough or whether you think you're not good enough, that you've got no chance at all. God says everyone can come and have the same mercy. You think about those two men in Luke 18. You know, there's one man, all he can do is lift up his eyes uh, and, and say, Lord, be, be merciful to me, a sinner. In fact, he doesn't lift up his eyes, does he? He has his eyes down, he beats his breast and says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. It hasn't got to be an eloquent prayer. It's got to be a heartfelt prayer. It's got to be a sincere prayer. So that's the first thing you need from God. That's the first grace that you need from God, that you will be saved. But secondly, we must bring the vessel of desire uh, for as we see in the Sermon on the Mount, we are told that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. But as Christians, do we hunger like that? Do we hunger for God? Are we thirsty for God? Are we thirsty for a real sense of his presence in our lives? Are we thirsty for his peace? Are we thirsty for his holiness? Are we thirsty for an ongoing relationship with him? <coughs> We, we were reading this, listening this morning to this, 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 this concept of God, you know, uh, weeping over us, you know, loving us, being tender to us. God wants us to come to him for his grace. And then lastly, we need to come to God uh, and we must bring the vessel of the surrendered life. You notice that these vessels were empty and, and Elisha uh, emphasises that, doesn't he? He says, empty vessels. Right, he says, go and borrow vessels, empty vessels. You see, we need to come empty of ourselves to God, don't we? We can't come half full, we can't come half-hearted, we can't come with something else in the bottle and go, well, can you just top me up? No, no, we have to be completely empty. And so it's a, a challenge for us as Christians. Are we half-hearted or are we whole-hearted for God? With the stress and the strain of, of life, Kind of meant that we've taken our eyes just a bit off of God and we're kind of so focused on what we're doing that we've forgotten that we need God to fill our vessel. We need God to fill our lives with his grace. His grace. You see, the story of Israel really throughout uh, Samuel and the Kings, those four books, and even before with, with, with Judges really, is that they kind of wanted... As we said a week ago, a bob each way, didn't they? They wanted God, but they wanted other things. And uh, uh, Charles this morning used this phrase, syncretism. This idea that we bolt things on to the worship of God. Well, I'll have God, and, and I'm happy to go to church, and I'm happy to, to do a bit of this and that, but I, I also want this. I also want something else. It may be a person, or it may be a job, or it may be all sorts of things. But God says to us, no. We must come to him every day, with that same absolute sense of surrender that we came to him when we were first converted. Remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler? He says, go sell all you have. Get rid of everything. Why? Because all of those things are stopping you following me. They're more important than me. That command is a constant command to us. We are to let everything go that is more important.
And so let's we close our time tonight. Let's ask ourselves, do we want the oil of God's grace to be flowing into our lives? Are we saved? Are we walking with him? Are we coming to him daily as empty vessels, as empty and surrendered people to the one who gives us his grace? To, if we come to him, we must do so humbly, uh, empty, uh, recognising that we need all things. I think these things the story shows to us, and uh, may God bless his word to us. Amen. Amen. Well, let's close by singing number 710 in the Mission Praise. Sorry, not 710, 702 in the Mission Praise. 702. And uh, it's difficult to find a hymn, really, that, 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 that went uh, with this. But uh, this one I've chosen because it reminds us that whatever our circumstances, whatever the changing scenes of life are, uh, we still can come to God. We can still praise him, worship him, and remember that he is the God of all grace. And so let's stand to sing number 702. Grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.